So in this context, uh, in a recent, very recent book published in French uh, just uh, a few months ago, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato has uh, uh, reconstructed uh, as, as focus on the notion of debt and has written a book where he argues uh, that within the current uh, political economy of capital, capitalism, the relation between debtors and creditors uh, becomes the primary form of expression of power relations. So it over determines everything. Even the post owner of a factory has to obey the bank that lends in the money to the liquidity. So, in this context, undoubtedly, uh, we, had, uh, we witnessed a process of decomposition of labor, of what used to be the organized labor. People who get, get up in the morning, spend eight hours together uh, doing the same thing for 30 years. That, that kind of labor has been decomposed more and more. Uh, what you have is an extreme fragmentation, uh, high percent segmentation of labor, uh, you have a, 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 a polarization between huge salaries of very few people and you know, declining salaries of the masses. Uh, this is in condition of individualization of, of, of labor relations. That's a one to one thing. We don't kind of personal uh, affective dynamics that are going on. So this is what is called precarity, uh, which can no longer be represented by traditional unions, which are really suffering from that. They cannot represent uh, uh, this within a context of competitive individualism, and there's a you know, subjectifying effects that this has, where uh, we are uh, um, subjectified, we are made to feel like we're all entrepreneurs of ourselves. So we're kind of human capital, so as we call that, we invest in ourselves. In order to get an income out of ourselves as our own capital. And hence, you know, that's another means through which we are caught in this process of financialization. We think of ourselves as capital, human capital. So, what about the recomposition of labor? <coughs> this might be controversial, so we might talk about it. Uh, within the idea that there is an hegemony of immaterial, uh, cognitive, uh, and affective uh, labor, uh, we need to say that this hegemony, the idea that you know, the key uh, form of labor today is immaterial, uh, is cognitive and affective, is not related to the fact that we are all immaterial workers. You know, the, the term is somehow misleading. It's related to the fact that uh, the heart of production, the engine of production, the energy of production, the human energy, is based on the cognitive, perceptive, and nervous powers of the body. This is what is being uh, put to work the social relation uh, as such. In fact, Lazzarato has introduced an, uh, an interesting uh, and crucial distinction. He says the distinction is not between manual and intellectual labor. The distinction is between repetitive labor, you know, which is uh, subjected to external control, and labor which has a degree of autonomy over the working hours and time uh, and so on. So, but this is within what we might understand as a continuum of social production. Is being defined, which takes place both within and outside the times and spaces of paid work and its division of labor. So the recomposition of labor uh, happens in a context where everything, all the kind of technologies of subjectivation, uh, try to make us into competitive individuals. So, try to make us into people who think about themselves as individuals in competitive markets. But according uh, to this perspective, there is a big tension between this kind of extreme individualism and the fact that this kind of labor tends towards cooperation. In fact, you know, the part about reality TV that I was talking about, because I always thought that reality TV, all these games, really express the schizophrenia of the contemporary living labor between uh, competition and cooperation. You have these spaces that kind of dramatize uh, labor condition. You have to cooperate because you know, that's a part of the job, but within a context of individualism. <coughs> so we uh, have this tension you know, of the deliberating tension, the autonomous tension is not towards competition, which is uh, something that actually is uh, destroying the fact of public association, but it's towards cooperation. 
uh, again, you know, we might ask ourselves uh, what is what is called social cooperation if it's not a division of labor? You know, what does it mean to have? You, you know that about uh, managing an occupied space. That's social cooperation. It's not just about division of labor. It's about social relations. <laughs> Another controversial uh, thesis uh, we might talk about that uh, would be interesting to uh, uh, have a dialogue with you about that. So, is it possible that, can we argue that if you have this fragmentation uh, and precarization of pay work <coughs> on the one side, which is making the resistance very difficult, uh, and on the other side, you have the creation of a technology which is creating a, a kind of continuum of communication. So those who are separated and fragmented uh, at the local level, Stigler said uh, in uh, cognitive level, it's been proletarianized, it's been expropriated of uh, knowledge. Even as it uses knowledge as an impossible. And on the other hand, you have this creation of these massive uh, networks of communication. So can we say that contemporary labor is not unified and possibly cannot be unified by disconnecting? We've gone from the, the unity of the factories of physical space and the analogy of uh, you know, the factories and more to uh, connected networks. We are all working in different ways, but we're all connected uh, through social media, to cellular communication, which is the most diffused uh, cell phone uh, medium in the world. That's a lot more mobile phones than any other technology in computers. We are involved in uh, connected through algorithmic socialization, which is what you get on uh, platform, social media platforms. You get al algorithms uh, uh, telling you who you should be friends with, uh, uh, showing the question that you put as well, no? So they're telling you who you should be friends with. They're telling you, they're determining what you see and how you see it. And it's done in this kind of automatic way. So uh, and then uh, you have uh, a shift uh, from the virtual, the internet, the virtual space, uh, what new media theories that we call it mixed reality. So mixed reality means that uh, you don't need even to sit in front of a computer and log on uh, to get involved in the virtual, but you carry it with you all the time, uh, through smartphones uh, and all other kind of tablets. Uh, you, know, you, you just need to go on a train. Uh, see how many people are actually there, kind of half there and half not there. And there is a little bit more, uh, more. So the key point is uh, the conditions for the compositional level in ways that can express some kind of resistance against this uh, way of life that I think we're all rejecting because you know, we really push these limits. Can happen through the medium or seems to be happening be able to happen only through the medium which expresses the most advanced organizational capital. So we are connected uh, through technologies uh, which are at the heart of this reorganizational capital and which have become over the years more and more corporate. So it's a really ambivalent theory. So the political economy of social media needs to address this relation between the ways this uh, social media express and capture of uh, social cooperation and social relations uh, as such, but also, and this is maybe you know, where we have some uh, difference with images, what are the lines of flight, you know, what are the uh, opportunities, what, what is being created there which is not completely captured and absorbed uh, within the mechanisms of capitalist valorization. So the political economy of social media, which uh, starting to be called also personal media, biomedia, the term that is going around, cellular media, mixed reality media. How does it work? The composition of labor uh, in this context is quite clear. Uh, out of the whole uh, labor as an abstract force that goes into the political economy and social media, a tiny segment is paid work. Uh, how many people does Facebook employ? Or Google? Time the majority of the production, production of content, production of activity, production of data is created by users, if you want to call them like that. Uh, I think they call them their profiles. 
the older profile. But this is something that uh, ages ago I uh, thought was a free label. So there's a capitalization on, on data emerging from users' interaction, uh, the harvest in that. There is an incorporation of volunteer work and open source model. Capital loves volunteering and open source because it reduces their cost, uh, the, the cost of labor. They have the property of personal data generated by interaction. They're very mysterious about it. I think that it's our data and uh, you know, should be made common, not public. Because they'll be interested uh, to see what's coming out of that. And it's operating basically on a business model which is driven by marketing and business. So it's about targeted personal uh, marketing where your computer recognizes who you are and deduces uh, through algorithms uh, what you might be interested in buying or not and then sells the smart advertising uh, what kind of business. At the same time, it's not just a question of application, but it's also intervening, you know, very materially the way we relate socially to each other. There's an interesting concept uh, coming out of the work of Bernard Stigler. He talks about uh, the grammatization of social relations. By grammatization, it means the fact that uh, uh, he says it's, a, it's an old process of grammatization. He starts with writing. Uh, he talks about Plato and uh, the Phaedrus. Right. But it means breaking down into discrete steps something that maybe was continuous before. So social networks are becoming, and I'm talking about internet social networks, <coughs> that which allows for social relations and social dynamics to become measurable. So you can measure the number of friends that you have, how many people liked what you wrote. Uh, you can measure how many people shared what you wrote, how many people commented, how many people are following you. you know, all these terms, Verbs which describe forms of social relation and become automated, they become measurable, uh, and hence uh, can form the basis for the production of economic value. That's another element. If we follow you know, what has been the critique of political economy, you know, the people who talked about desire as a constituent element of economy, in fact, we can leave it outside. Uh, uh, we've been getting quite a lot of writings lately uh, which talk about the subjective effects and subjectivity of uh, social uh, communication. And it hasn't been good news at all. <coughs> so I think there's a, a wave of kind of uh, backlash, quite strong, against the power of social communication. So you have uh, people like Joe Bidinia who talks about compulsive communication, the compulsive drive. Uh, Check your email, uh, you know, the kind of uh, reaction you get when you hear a sound that you think might be something that has to do with your uh, you know, news coming up, emails coming up, SMS. And uh, it's been talking about affected networks and the capture by communicative capitalism of uh, uh, desiring energy. And Stigler as well you know, agrees with that, saying that we have the decomposition of libidinal energy, the desiring energy, into drives to the compulsion that is about repetition and repetition and repetition uh, uh, just to get a tiny bit of enjoyment, she said, that you really get uh, from that. You have somebody like Sherry Tarko, who's one of the first ethnographers of uh, the internet, uh, who in her latest book uh, uh, says that uh, social media become really disruptive of sociality. Uh, so she talks about uh, uh, us as being alone together, or like fake intimacies place, about a new generation that uh, is incapable of communicating face-to-face -face and doesn't even talk on the phone anymore because that's too intimate. It's all about texting. So there's bad news on that side. Uh, before I just published a book where he says that he has scientifically determined that there's not going to be any chance of uh, uh, revolution because the, you know, we're all basically being screwed by <laughs> these technologies so we are, uh, you know, cognition is messed up. Or we, suffer a crisis of tension and you know, they And also there is a tendency to absorb the excess that's coming out of these networks in terms of the anger, the regular anger that people are feeling about deteriorating uh, condition into a regime of kind of networked public opinion. So it's all opinions circulating, clashing, uh, these kind of knee-jerk reactions of, of, of 
indignation. So it's not good uh, news uh, around that. Still, you know, I think we should take, uh, in spite of the kind of mood, not just markets and mood, also theoretical research and social research and also moods. So the moods right now become strong. Let's say. I still think that we should uh, take into consideration other perspectives, uh, which uh, are a bit difficult to summarize. So I'm going to try uh, a bit for you. Uh, I, I wrote an article on that uh, for the Touching Society about uh, the idea that uh, there's not just capture going on here, but in uh, social networks uh, can be considered uh, as something that is producing a kind of deterritorialized society. They're not just uh, uh, decreasing our powers of being, but they're also doing something uh, to social relations. They're making them more fluid. Uh, they're amplifying uh, the number of contacts uh, that we can actually have. They're segmenting uh, the, the public notion of public is the main engagement of the mass uh, media. There's a kind of hydrodynamic to the formation of the uh, Publics in social networks, uh, which is a final and final segmentation of public opinion that, that we have had. Uh, I would like also to uh, think, uh, you know, maybe not in this context, uh, about what does it mean to uh, the fact that uh, mainstream economists are talking about the economy of attention uh, these days. Uh, what does it mean to say that the productive powers uh, mobilized by this political economy are uh, the, uh, basically the productive powers of uh, uh, brain, uh, neuro powers, uh, uh, what does it mean to think about social networks as uh, crossed by flows of beliefs and desires, which is spreading and encountering. Uh, a very interesting book by Lazzarato, uh, The Critique of Political Economy, who talks exactly about that, about this kind of the social dynamics uh, of uh, uh, the, the creation of social values uh, through the circulation of beliefs, desires, and affect. And what does it mean to think of social networks as sites for processes of formation of new collectivities, a process of transdividuation, which are a lot more mobile, a lot more dynamic, uh, a lot, uh, even ephemeral, you know, too quick, sometimes appear and disappear. You know, what does it mean to think about this context uh, as the basis of a possible recomposition of the capacity of labor, struggling against the current? So we have this ambivalence of social media, the conditions for a new unity and hence autonomy of living labor, whose meaning as we see seen changed, are given within the conditions of connectedness on capitalist platforms and technologies. You know, is it something, uh, yeah, I, think, I still think there's an ambivalence uh, there, you know, that is uh, not really completely captured or liberated uh, by, by capital. And uh, I, I think that this uh, desire of living labor to break out of this condition of exploitation and uh, the general condition of life, uh, as it is emerging through all kinds of movements that have uh, taken place over the past few years, are characterized by the refusal, not just of exploitation within the work space and times, but overall forms of government. So they haven't been targeted at the specific uh, at the boss as much as uh, overall forms of government. I just wanted to mention the importance of the post-court uh, on neoliberalism. Yes. You know, the way in which he argued already in the 1970s that uh, neoliberalism was not about the subsumption of the market, uh, of the state by the market, but it was about the transformation of what it means to govern. Uh, the living good uh, government over the past few years uh, by states which have modeled their own action on the market. I would believe Foucault by his And go on modeling the social media of the issue. I think it's important because he shows, he's the missing link. He shows how uh, resistance to capitalist exploitation has to go to the refusal of the current political rationality and modes of government. Which are not just about economy, but about everything. Because they're changing everything, they're affecting everything, they're remodeling everything according to this logic. So the, the target does not become just a capitalist class, but it becomes a whole.
structure goes all the way of the finger bone, <coughs> which is under a lot of pressure right now. And it's kind of uh, recomposing itself. I don't know that. <laughs> so the autonomous label seems to me to pass to the refusal to be governed in this way, the search for different ways to be governed, not to return to planning of the real economy against uh, as an alternative to free finance of the market. But the substitution of competition and profit as the heart of the current, not just economy, but government, governmentality, which means everything. You know, even bringing up children is uh, pro analyst. And profit with cooperation and economics. You know, how is it possible to make this shift? Um, we can look at current political movements from North Africa to the United States, and we can look at some of the Greece, uh, uh, of course, we can look at some of the slogans that are coming out of that. We need to look at that, and the, the most organized is the method is mixed media, not just as virtual, but something that completely interacts with the And the key word that we occupy everything, stop everything, because everything stops circulation. Everybody must go, social people, not state people, but social people, for the institution, guaranteed interest rather than debt, new welfare for support of material and So, of course, in some questions, what are the chances the struggles against neoliberal governmentality and competitive capitalism can succeed through social media if the latter are owned by capital? The media is probably not saying that. Can corporate internet media giants be turned into the infrastructure of the new company, the principle that displaces the market as competition? Is there an excess of social cooperation as that which takes place with social networks with respect to the strategies of culture that we talked about? And finally, if you're tending towards that, you're tending towards replacing competition with social cooperation and financialization and privatization of liquidity, socialization of money, uh, let's say, uh, how do that? You know, what is the specificity of the social cooperation that they would like? replace you know, the principle of competition and privatization. Great, thank you very much. I'm sure that